I invite you to take your Bibles once more and turn in the Old Testament to the prophet Hosea. Hosea chapter 14. Once more, I remind you that this is God's Word. And so let us give our attention to its reading. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity, Accept what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses, and we will say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. In you, the orphan, finds mercy. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely. For my angry, my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive and his fragrance like Lebanon. They shall return and dwell beneath my shadow. They shall flourish like the grain. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we come this morning to our final sermon on the book of Hosea, I remind you it has been not a hopefully difficult time of study, But it has been challenging. Hosea's words have been interpreted variously throughout church history. But the message, and while they have been interpreted differently, and what I mean by that is whether or not he actually married a prostitute. But its message has been clearly proclaimed. That is, that God will judge sin. We saw this last week once more in the cycle of sin and judgment. And the language was striking. The language would strike some as harsh. But we noted that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so while Hosea proclaimed judgment, he is also calling the people to repent. And that's how it ends. That's how the entire book ends. And it might seem a bit odd because the book has had such great judgment. Matthew Henry writes, this is a wonderful chapter to be at the end of such a book. I had never expected from such a prickly shrub to gather so fair a flower. So sweet, so sweet a fruit. But so it is. Where sin abounded, grace does abound much more. And so our chapter this morning concerns repentance. It concerns a call to return back to the Lord. It concerns the promise of mercy. And then it leaves with us the question, who is wise? Who will turn? Who will return to the Lord? Let's look at our passage as it falls out in these three points this morning. First, the call to repentance. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. This is not the first call to repentance. 
Indeed, we have noted throughout the book of Hosea that there is almost at times a pleading on the part of God that His people would not be destroyed. That they would not give themselves over to sin, but that they would turn from their sin and they would live. And this, this, this call for repentance continues through the ages. The apostle will say in Acts that God commands all people everywhere to repent. Jesus came proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This call is given time after time, ever since the entrance of sin into the world in the Garden of Eden, to return to the Lord. Notice that that first is what repentance means. It is a turning, it is a returning to the Lord. The Hebrew word, shuv, it means to turn away from the direction you were going and to return to where you have come from, to return to the Lord. This is the one to whom we are called to return. Notice again that it's all capital letters, L-O-R-D. It is the covenant, Lord. The one who revealed himself to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The one who appeared and spoke to Moses from the burning bush. The one who led Israel out of Egypt through the Exodus. The one who safely brought them to the wilderness, into the promised land. This is no foreign God to whom they are to return. They are to return to the covenant God who has loved him and who has given himself for them. This will always be the call to repentance. To return. To return to the Lord, to turn away from our sin. You see, this is what he says, that our sin is our stumbling. You have stumbled because of your iniquity. The image is of one of a, of a person going along upon a path and, and, and just stepping, trying to find the most difficult route to go and stumbling over the rocks. And that's what sin is, of course, in the life of God's people. It is a stumbling. It is not sure footing. It is not placing your feet exactly where they ought to go in order to keep you from falling. But rather it is a turning away from God. A turning away from the path of righteousness. And so their sin is their, step, their stumble. They stumble because of their iniquity. Their idols. Remember, of course, and, and I've just been struck this summer and, and over these last weeks about how, how relevant Hosea is. Remember Israel's struggle. They were falling into idolatry. But their idolatry was shown in a very particular way. They're visiting cult prostitutes. They're putting sex at the center of everything that they were. So they're called to turn away from this and to turn toward their God. This is what it says uh, there in verse 2. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity. Uh, you might wonder that take with you words. It might sound like cheap grace. I mean, after all, this is all the sin that they have done before God. They have, they have rebuked, they, they, they have rejected Him. They have turned away. They have offered up sacrifices to false gods. They have entered into covenants with other nations. They have done all the things that God commanded them to do. How can mere words make amends? Well, it is true that mere words do not make amends. The Apostle Paul will say that there is worldly grief that produces death. But the presence of words doesn't make it that way. For he says that there is godly grief that produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. I think, I think it's best even to think about these words. Take with you words and return to the Lord uh, with what Jesus himself will say. That out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Think of David's prayer in Psalm 51 that we sang. Some might read that and say, or some might sing that and say, can that be enough? Think of what David did. He seduced another man's wife. He had that man murdered. How on earth could he think that words would be enough? 
But of course, David knew that words were not enough. It's not about bringing words. It's not about eloquence. It's about pouring out yourself. It's about a broken heart, a contrite heart. The Lord will not reject. You see, repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry. But rather, it's returning to the Lord. It's a turning away from sin and idolatry. It's a looking at, the, at, at, at the, those things that trip you up, beloved. And recognizing that and turning away and looking to God as your only hope. It's the tax collector who can't even lift his eyes to heaven, but beats his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's the younger son who, when he comes to himself, sees the mess that he has made of his life and the way in which his sin has taken him far away from his father who loves him. And going back and saying, Father, I am not even worthy to be called your son. I have sinned against heaven and before you. You see, beloved, this is repentance. It is a call. It is a turning to the, a returning to the Lord. And we see this here in the call. We see the way of return. Hosea goes on. He says, accept what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. Take away all iniquity. This, after all, is, is the heart of what we need. That our iniquity would be taken away. Other translations might give it differently. Receive us graciously, it says. Hosea is not saying that one's good works will earn them the right to worship God in the future. No, of course not. Rather, he is saying that the repentant person is calling upon the Lord to accept what they are doing. That is their return to Him in prayer. It's acknowledging dependence upon the Lord. Look at verse 3. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses. Now that might seem odd to you, especially if you've not been with us over the summer. Uh, but this was what Israel was doing. They were, making, they were making covenants with Assyria. They were making covenants with Egypt. They were trying to play both sides in order to try to see who could protect them rather than turning to the Lord their God. Instead, they would, would scheme all the various ways that they would protect themselves. Here what we see is repentance is acknowledging our dependence upon the Lord. As our psalm of, in the call to worship said, Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. They not only acknowledge their dependence, they must turn away from sin. He goes on, and we will say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. And this is a very shorthand way of referring to everything about idolatry that they have gotten themselves into, that they've given themselves over to. Isaiah talks about how, 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 how a craftsman, he fells a tree, he takes part of it, and he uses it to, to cook his food, to warm himself. He makes, uh, takes another part, and he carves a, a, an idol out of it, and then he bows down and worships it. This is the work of his own hands. And yet again, it reminds us of the ways in which we are oftentimes giving ourselves over to depend upon the works of our hands. The gain that we get from our vocation, the abilities that we have with our minds, where is our trust? It must be in the Lord. We cannot say our God to the work of our hands. Remember all that Israel had done for idolatry. The Baals, the Asherah, Molech, the Moabite women. Every high place and under every tree, they offered up worship and sacrifice to all the so-called gods. They must recognize that these are all the work of their hands. And they must reject it. Repentance includes recognizing all the ways in which we have tried to replace God whether with self 
with idols or with anything else. And you might wonder, it seems awfully risky. Israel is being asked to turn away from all of their scheming, from all of their plans, from all of the things that they have in place. Who will they trust in? They're being told, turn away from it all and turn to the Lord. Is there good hope that God would hear them? Is there good hope that God would redeem them? Hosea reminds us that he is the God of mercy. In you, the orphan finds mercy. You might wonder why, why it's the orphan there. It's, in the Old Testament, there's often reference to orphans and widows, to soldier, sojourners, strangers, aliens. This language comes up to remind us of those who are helpless, of those who are in need. And here's Israel, helpless, in need. They've turned away from their God. They, like the younger brother, have run off and they've squandered their wealth on anything that was wrong, would they return? You see, this is the call. The call is that they would turn, and what would they find? They would find a God, a Heavenly Father, who is full of mercy, who is full of kindness, who is full of compassion. You see, this is the ground of God's work throughout redemptive history. I mean, think about it, beloved. From Genesis to Revelation, beginning there in the garden in the fall, as you read through the Old Testament, and I know this is true because my own children have pointed out, wow, they were really messed up. You get to points in reading together, and you, you began to wonder, how long will it go on? You see, God could have brought full and final judgment at any point, and he would have been right and righteous and good. But he didn't. Why? It's because of his great love. He is sovereign, but he is also merciful. For God so loved the world. And so there's a call to repentance. There's also a promise of mercy. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. Note first the apostasy that is healed. Note first that the apostasy must be healed. You cannot heal yourself. He is the Lord, their healer, as Exodus 15 and verse 26 says. If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. Now there's an interesting use of the word apostasy here. It's an interesting word. It's actually the same word as return. The word in Hebrew, actually as the, as the root, the same word. The word in Hebrew, remember, is shuv. That means to turn or to return, to turn around. But here it's, it's, it's actually just mishuvah. It's, it's, it puts a... a puts a, 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 a mish, uh, the, the, the name on the front. Sorry. It means to return from or to turn from. Apostasy is to turn away from the Lord. As he says in Hosea verse, chapter 11 and verse 7, my people are bent on turning away from me and though they call out to the Most High, they are bent on turning away. The story of Scripture teaches us clearly that sinful man is prone to wander from the Lord. How will that be overcome? How will it be overcome that our, that our hearts are prone to wander? The Lord must heal. The Lord must remedy it. That's actually the word for healing here. He must remedy it. He must remedy the apostasy. And interestingly, this becomes the Old Testament promise and expectation. Not just here in Hosea chapter 14, where God says that He will, in fact, heal their apostasy. We find in Ezekiel 37, where the Lord will cause breath, cause the Spirit to enter into those dead corpses and they will live. We find it in Jeremiah 31, where God will make a new covenant with Israel and with Judah. He will write his law upon their hearts. 
You find it in Ezekiel 36, where God says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And notice that this, this language here then in Hosea that's reflected throughout the Old Testament is, is the reminder that our salvation is not something that, that, that God does his part and then we work together and then finally we're saved. If that were the case, then our, our right standing before God would never be complete because we would never do enough. God says, I will heal their apostasy. I will put my spirit within them. I will cause them to walk in my statutes. Salvation from first to last must be God who works. He goes on, I will love them freely. This again is the story of all of scripture. God pursuing his people out of great love for them. Deuteronomy 7, it wasn't because you were one of the biggest, most populous nations on the earth or the peoples on the earth that I chose you, but I set my love on you, God says. John Calvin writes in his commentary, the prophet intended to add this as a seal to confirm what he taught. For men ever dispute with themselves when they hear that God is propitious to them. That is, that his wrath is satisfied. How is this that he heals your infirmities? For hitherto you have found him to be angry with you. And how are you now persuaded that his wrath is pacified? And so the prophet seals his testimony respecting God's love when he says that his wrath has now ceased. See, that's why he says, I will freely love them for my anger has turned from them. But is that it? Is it simply a matter of God going through anger management, as some would say, and then things are all right? Of course not. He is holy, he is righteous, and he is just. His holiness cannot be offended. His judgments are perfect, and so he must be both just and the justifier of the one who is to come before him. And that's what's so significant about Luke 15. For there is Jesus, the one who was sent from heaven to earth to come and to redeem sinners, reminding the Pharisees of why he's there, reminding them of the love of the Father that he has for his wayward children, of those who have wandered away from him. It is all, it is all based in the love of God. His grace and His mercy, but it is worked out on the cross of Jesus Christ. For it is there that we learn how God's anger will be turned away. It will only be through the satisfaction of sin, the death of the Son. But what is the result? God will heal, God will love. But look further in verse 5. I will be like the dew to Israel. This, what follows, by the way, is garden language. The garden of God's grace, I call it. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive. And his fragrance like Lebanon. It goes on to compare him to the wine of, Le of Lebanon. Everything is very garden-esque. And it reminds us that the Bible is a story from Genesis to Revelation about a garden. The garden in Eden that was planted, that God placed Adam and Eve in. The garden of the land of Canaan that was flowing with milk and honey into which God placed his people Israel. And fully and finally, the garden of God's grace in Revelation 21 and 22, where it's actually a big garden city, not with one tree of life, but with two. And in the midst of it all, the garden of Gethsemane, where the Savior suffered. You see, according to Scripture, 
This garden language very clearly points to God's grace. For wilderness was considered judgment. To be cast out of the garden was to be rejected from God's presence, put outside and away from Him, wandering. Whether we think of Adam and Eve or Cain, or whether we think of Israel, the point is the same. And so exile was another wilderness event. But now God says it will be garden-like again. Do blossoms, taking root, shoots, spreading out, beauty, fragrance. We don't get hung up on locations, but rather see what God is saying. He is going to restore his relationship to his people. And it will be greater. For it will be unbreakable. Verse 7, we see the repentant flourishing. They shall return and dwell beneath my shadow. They shall flourish like the grain. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Once more, we get that word. They are returning. They are turning from sin. Their apostasy has been healed. Now they return to the Lord. They will come and they, dwell, they will dwell under the shelter of of the Most High, as Psalm 91 says, they shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. In other words, the result here is that the believers who trust in the Lord, they actually become part of this garden. They are likened to grain, they are likened to the vine. And we shouldn't be surprised to find Jesus using this exact same idea in the Gospels. In the Gospel of John, chapter 15, he says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, Jesus reminds us that he is that central vine in the garden. In fact, all of the promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ, including this one in Hosea. To remember the story, the core story of Hosea. He took to himself an unfaithful bride, and that bride rejected him. That bride went away from him. That bride gave herself up to sin and debauchery. And what is Hosea told to do? He is told to go and to buy his bride back. And he goes. And there she is on the auction block. And he takes everything that he has. And he buys her back. And he brings her home. And that's the story of Hosea. And that's the story of the whole of Scripture. For Jesus comes to buy back his bride, the church. Jesus comes not with, not with money, not with perishable things like silver and gold, but as Peter says, with his own blood. And so, beloved, in Christ we are planted in this garden. This is why we flourish. This is why we bear good fruit. It is only in Jesus Christ. And then we come to our conclusion of the whole book. Verses 8 and nine. It begins with God's words, Oh Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? Now this is rhetorical questioning. God is not expecting an answer. The point is he has nothing to do with idols. He doesn't employ them to do his bidding as though they are like angels. He doesn't desire his people to acknowledge them as anything except false gods that tempt them away from true worship. You see, it is not many paths leading to the same destination. No, there is one true God. And it is only He who is to be worshipped. It is only through Jesus that we come before the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. The people of Israel have been joined to idols. And God makes clear that He, is not, he has nothing to do with them. He has nothing to do with those idols. No, instead, he says, it, was I, it is I who answer and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. Remember that Israel had 
trusted the Baal, Baal being the kind of cloud god who provided seed uh, uh, into the ground, the rain, and caused the fruit to come forth. And so the Israelites would go to the temples uh, and they would partake in the various rituals in order to appease and to get the blessings from Baal. And God is saying, you think you ever got anything from a false god? You think you ever got anything from an idol? It was the Lord it was His grace and it was His mercy. It was He who looked after them even as they turned away. It was He who looked day after day like the father waiting for the prodigal to return. It was never Baal. The Lord was the one who cared for them all along. Like the father of a small child without any sense, the Lord had cared for Israel in spite of His wickedness and idolatry. And now he calls them to recognize that. He calls us to respond to that, to acknowledge that there is nothing that we get by our own hands. It is not about our scheming. It is not about our plotting. It is not about our abilities, our intellect, or our lack of intellect. It is about trusting Jesus Christ. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. See, this is a call for wisdom. I found this kind of odd at the very end of a book, a prophetic book, a book of prophetic sermons, calling the people, uh, telling the people about judgment. But remember that there's a remnant in Israel. There was a remnant that was there, and so God is appealing to them to trust in Him. And you see, the gospel continues to go forth into this world. And there are those who respond, there are those who hear it and they see their sin and their need and they turn to Christ and there are those who shrug and walk away in unbelief. You see, this verse 9 is a call for wisdom, asking which son will you be? Will you be the prodigal who sees his sin and his need for the Father's forgiveness, who comes humbly himself Casting himself upon the mercy of the Father. For the one who believed he had nothing to repent of. Who was angered by his Father's mercy to the prodigal. And who refused to see his own need or his Father's mercy as anything except worthy of contempt. You see, that's why Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son. Because there were those who were grumbling, saying this man received sinners... And eats with them. But beloved, it is good news that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and that Jesus receives sinners. It is not about being perfect and holy before we come to the Lord. No, we come humbly relying upon him, trusting in him, because he is the one who said he will put his spirit within us. The ways of the Lord are right. And the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. These are the ends. These are, these are the last words of this book. There's a danger that Hosea seems to end with here of not understanding his words. The danger that people will read what Hosea has said and not understand it or maybe miss, miss some of the nuances or, or, or misunderstand the message itself or be offended. Or to hear them and to simply walk away shrugging. But beloved, I implore you this day to return to the Lord, to trust in Him, to cling to Christ, the one who is the fulfillment of the promise of Hosea. You will say that your repentance is weak, but I tell you to flee to Christ. To cling to the cross, even in weak repentance, even in struggle, trust in him, for he alone can save. And he is the one who has promised to do it. As Richard Sibb says in the bruised wheat, read, cast yourself into the arms of Christ. And if you perish, perish there. If you do not, you are sure to perish. If mercy is to be found anywhere, it is here in the arms of Christ.